Good evening. It's a wonderful evening to study God's Word. Amen. We are blessed to be able to gather together, and I want to, uh, whether you know it or not, you are a blessed people that meets here at Charlotte Avenue. Uh, the privilege to be able to work alongside Andy Brewster and Lena, uh, that's definitely a privilege that you should not take for granted. Uh, he is one of God's great servants, and I appreciate the support that you all give him. But I got a problem with him. Every time I, I'm able to come here, he decides he just wants to leave and go elsewhere. So I don't know what's going on. Maybe it is that people just see my name and they just flee as fast as they can. But it's good that you're here. And let's study God's word together. But before we do that, let's go to God in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. And we can't thank you enough for all the blessings that we have received in Christ. Father, tonight we are thankful for the opportunity to surround your word. To drink from it and to learn from it. I pray that we will have ears to hear what your word says. Father, guide us in all things and give us the strength to obey you, to please you each and every day. We thank you for Jesus, and it's in his name we pray. Amen. There was a German-born prospector in the 19th century named Jacob, Jacob Waltz. He is also known as the Dutchman. And in Arizona, he found a treasure worth up to $200 million. And he hid it in the Superstition Mountains. On his deathbed in 1891, he told uh, a couple of people some intriguing clues to give them the location of the place where the treasure was hidden. And this treasure really didn't become famous, it didn't become widespread until a treasure hunter named Adolf Ruth went looking for the treasure and actually went missing in 1931. Later that year, they actually found Adolf Ruth's body. They found a skull with two holes in it, and they were able to identify it as Ruth. This treasure, even to this day, has people looking for this gold mine or this area with $200 million. And it has been labeled before as America's deadliest treasure. It's in a, a tough area to navigate. And there are even television shows that you can watch on people looking for this treasure. There are shows all over our televisions about treasures like it, and some people that spend their entire lives, maybe even losing their life, looking for a treasure. And I think about that, and I think about how often we look for treasures in life. It may not be a, a cache of gold worth $200 million, but we look for that treasured job. We look for that treasured uh, lakefront property. We look for that treasured vehicle that we're always looking for. Or perhaps we're looking for the treasure of someone's approval that we care deeply about. We search for all kinds of treasures in life. And when we're looking for these treasures and we're putting all of our eggs into that proverbial basket, we are going to come up empty. The preacher in the book of Ecclesiastes says that all is vanity and a striving after the wind. The problem with these treasures and these things that we look for that are physical is they, they're hollow, they're empty, and they, they leave us feeling that way. They may give us joy for a time. But that joy fades. Tonight I want to look at a treasure that does not fade, is not corrupted, and will never leave us feeling empty. If you would turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 13. Matthew chapter 13. Jesus is telling parables. He spoke many times in such a fashion. And he says in Matthew chapter 13, verse 44, The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and covered up. 
Then in his joy he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls, who, on finding one pearl of great value, went and sold all that he had and bought it. As soon as I hear this parable, these parables, I think about the value of such a treasure. And Jesus likens finding these treasures to the kingdom of heaven. He says the kingdom of heaven is like this. Tonight we need to realize that we have found a great treasure. Nothing we own, or if we took everything that we owned and we added it up, we could get one lump sum. We might actually be lucky that it's more than our debts. But, but anyways, we could take everything that we own and we could take all the treasures of the world and we could add them up and they would not compare to the treasures of heaven. They would not compare to the kingdom. They would not compare to the blessings that God desires for us. No status we might receive is worth trading for heaven. You see, in the parables, when these individuals found the pearl of great price and the hidden treasure, they know immediately that they should give everything that they had to find it. Very much what, like what the preacher said in the book of Ecclesiastes, John said in 1 John chapter 2 that the things of this earth are passing away. The lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. The things that are, are, are physical are passing away. And the thing is, the things that are eternal, the kingdom of heaven, the reason that is different, the reason that it is substantive is because it is eternal. It is something that will not fade away. Jesus even instructed his disciples in the Sermon on the Mount. Don't invest, don't store up your treasures here on earth where moth and rust are able to destroy and where thieves are able to break in and steal. But instead, invest and store up treasures in heaven where those things are not able to take place. The kingdom of heaven is worth far more, far more than anything we can collect here on this earth. It's worth more than our monies. It's worth more than our jobs. And it's worth more than the approval of others. The first thing we need to understand is we have found a great treasure. The second thing we should notice from these parables is the cost of such treasures. What did it take for these individuals to receive the treasure, what did the text say? So in verse 44, which a man found and he covered it up. Then in his joy, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Likewise, in the parable of the pearl of great price, he sold all that he had to buy that one. That one. It's easy to understand I guess on some level, how valuable the kingdom of heaven is. But it's much harder to be willing to pay the price. It's much harder to be willing to give up everything that we have in order to receive the kingdom of heaven, in order to obtain it. It's a hard thing to achieve. I noticed that you guys have been studying being devoted, and I've talked to Andy before about how you studied Acts chapter 2, and how the early church was devoted to one another. I want you to think about the great cost that that incurred. Think about what the early church devoted themselves to. They devoted themselves to fellowship, to the apostles' teachings, the breaking of bread, prayer, sacrificial giving. They attended worship together day by day. They shared meals in their homes, and they were praising God. Those things in Acts chapter 2, they cost a great deal. 
that costs, whether it is a large sum of money, to be able to give sacrificially, give until it hurts. It may cost a physical price. And then all the time that the church must sacrifice in order to be devoted to one another, that is a huge cost as well. It takes effort and energy to be a member of God's church. And when we aren't willing to pay that price, we are like a man who sees a hidden treasure and says, well, that's real nice, and that'd be wonderful to have, but I'm not willing to foot the bill. I'm afraid a lot of times we see the cost. We read passages like Acts chapter 2, verses 42 to 47, and we see what the early church was involved in, and we say, yeah, that'd be real nice, but I'm not willing to do that. We in the churches of Christ strive to be like the first century church. We follow their example of worship and conduct. Shouldn't we also mirror their level of devotion? They were willing to do whatever it takes. They were willing to sacrifice their time, their energy, their resources for the sake of the kingdom of heaven. And that is exactly what Jesus taught his disciples. The kingdom of heaven is like a hidden treasure that you find. And when you see it, you realize I've got to give up everything that I've got in order to receive it. And it's also like this pearl of great price that as soon as you see it, you realize how valuable it is. And you understand that it's going to take everything. We understand this, don't we? There are so many things in life that we are willing to put forth effort to. Many of us understand how much work it takes to go to college. We spend years of our life in a classroom. Just ask all of our young people how difficult that is. We see people that train to run a race. When we see people run marathons, we are seeing years of effort, hard work, getting up early and running day after day after day. We see people who are strong, and we see how much work it takes, or we understand how much work it takes, and we don't slouch at that. We just understand that if we want to be strong, if we want to run, or if we want to graduate college, it's going to take a lot of effort. It takes time, and it takes energy. Consider the pregnant mother. Consider how much time and effort and energy she is willing to give to have that beautiful child. We understand that the best things in life are things that take effort and take energy. And the kingdom of heaven is no different. In order to receive the kingdom of heaven, in order to be blessed by the kingdom of heaven, we have to be willing to sell all that we have. We have to be willing to give everything, the totality of our life. It has to go toward the kingdom of heaven. And there was actually an individual who Jesus taught about this very thing. If you would turn just a few chapters over to Matthew chapter 19. Matthew chapter 19. Starting in verse 16. And behold, a man came up to him saying, Teacher, what good deed must I do to have eternal life and he said to him why do you ask me about what is good there is only one who is good if you would enter life keep the commandments and he said to him which ones and Jesus said you shall not murder you shall not commit adultery you shall not steal you shall not bear false witness you shall honor your father and mother and you shall love your neighbor as yourself the young man said to him all these have I, I have kept what do I still lack? 
Jesus said to him, if you would be perfect, go sell what you possess and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven and come follow me. When the young man heard this, he went away sorrowful for he had great possessions. Notice what commands Jesus said, because Jesus said, keep the commandments, and, and, and that's how you inherit eternal life. Well, notice what commands Jesus actually mentioned. You shouldn't murder. You shouldn't commit adultery. You should not steal. You should not bear false witness and honor your father and mother, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I'm sure the young man there could have said, yeah, yep, check, 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 check. I'm good, Jesus. And Jesus told him, you still lack one thing. You lack sacrifice. You see, the young man probably didn't keep all the commandments, because there's one that Jesus didn't mention that I think we can apply he didn't keep. You shall have no other gods before me. I have to think if this man went away sorrowful because he had great possessions, I have to think that he was putting those possessions and Jesus knew this man's heart. And when he said that you should sell everything you have, he was hitting the man right between the eyes. He was saying what you value most, what you find as your identity and what you value and how other people look at you, you need to go sell all of that. Give it to the poor, and your treasure will be in heaven. Church, I have to think, or I imagine, that many of us could look at that list of commands, and we probably could say, check, yeah, I got that, I haven't done that. Check, check, check. And I have to wonder, would Jesus say the same thing to us? Yes, you guys have kept a lot of the commandments. I've kept a lot of the commandments, but you still lack one thing. You've got to be willing to do whatever it takes to go to heaven. If that doesn't challenge us, I'm not sure what does. We have to be willing to give everything. Now, I don't think Jesus is saying that, that this man or anybody, for that matter, needs to give away all that they have because then we ourselves would be the ones in need. The point is that we have to be willing. We have to be willing to take up our cross daily and follow Jesus. Nothing stands in the way of us getting to heaven. We're trying to get somewhere. The people in the story, the people in the parable were willing to do whatever it took because they saw the value of the treasure. And church, we need to see the value of what eternity with God is all about. The value of that, and as soon as we see the value of eternity with God, we will be willing to do whatever it takes, just like the child, or excuse me, the mother with the child. She is willing to pay the price because she knows what the result will be. The student is willing to put in the time and energy to study because he knows what the result will be. There will be a day when he's able to walk across that stage and receive that diploma. The runner puts in the days and the time because he knows that he needs to in order to cross that finish line. Church, the prize is beyond our imagination. Let's not lose out on that because we're unwilling to give everything. The young man obviously valued his stuff and Jesus told him to remove that form of identity. He wanted him to find his identity in him. In Jesus instead of himself and what he had accomplished. Going back to our parables, you might think on this a little while. 
And you might think, there may be another way of looking at these parables. There are some who believe that these parables are actually a flipped perspective. Some believe that we are the hidden treasure. We are the pearl of great price. And God was willing to do whatever it took to save us. I want to read these parables again, and I want you to think with, that, with those glasses on. With those glasses on, I want you to think about these parables. The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and covered up. Then in his joy, he goes and sells all that he has, even his only begotten son, and buys that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls, who on finding one pearl of great value, went and sold all that he had and bought it. I don't know exactly which way Jesus wants us to view these parables, but what I do know, what I do know, based on what Jesus did with his life, God treasures us. We see it time and time again in the scriptures that God was willing to give up this. God was willing to bless us in this way. God was willing to, to, to bear the brunt of that so that we can have this blessing. And even to the point that he was willing to give up his only begotten son. And really, in reality, it is a blessing that we're even talking about this. That we're even saying that the kingdom of heaven is out there to be found. We didn't do anything to earn it. It's God's love and his mercy that allows us to seek after the kingdom of heaven because God treasures us. This is another layer to these parables. We, may be look, we might look at it in a, in a linear fashion that, okay, yes, there is a treasure out there, there is heaven, and I want to get there, and so I'm going to do whatever it takes to get there. We can look at it in that fashion, and that is, uh, I believe, what is the original intention. But what we forget, what we, when we look at it in that way, what we're not looking at is everything that took place to allow that to be our reality. Before you and I were born, before you and I were a thought outside of God's imagination, Jesus walked this earth and gave his entire existence for you and for me. The very possibility that there is a treasure out there to be found, which is the kingdom of heaven, is an act of God's mercy and his grace. We need to praise God for the opportunity to find him. Praise God for the opportunity to be with him for eternity because he acted first. We were dead in our sins. If you would turn in your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2. We're going to read the first five verses. You see a bleak scenario. God treasures us. Well, what, what were we? What were we that God would, would care for us? This is what we were. Ephesians 2 and verse 1, And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. We are able to seek after the kingdom of heaven because of the mercy and grace of God. We are able to respond in obedience, 
faithful obedience to him as the scripture outlines all because of his mercy and grace. We were dead, but God made us alive together with Christ. God treasures us even when we were dead. The Bible also outlines in Galatians chapter 3, if you go back a couple of pages, that we were captive. Not only were we dead, but we were held captive under the law. We were unable to be good enough. We were unable to perfectly fulfill the law. Now, before faith came in Galatians 3 and verse 23... Verse 23, now before faith came, we were held captive under the law, imprisoned until the coming faith would be revealed. So then the law was our guardian until Christ came, in order that we might be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian, for in Christ Jesus, you are all slaves in God's house. You're on the bottom rung. You don't belong there, but God kind of lets you in. The scripture says that we are all sons of God through faith. We were dead. We were held captive. And not only did God free us, if we are in Christ, if we have been baptized into Christ... We have been set free and we have been welcomed into his household as sons and daughters of God. God treasures us. The Bible also teaches that we had no identity. In 1 Peter chapter 2, if you would turn there, 1 Peter chapter 2, Peter teaches that before Christ, we had no identity. Identity. 1 Peter 2 9. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people once you had not received mercy but now you have received mercy not only were we dead not only were we captive we were without identity we were drifting to and fro and God took a hold of us and said I want you to be my people those who obey and act in obedience to Jesus's words I want you to be my people I want you to be a holy nation, a royal priesthood. God treasures us. And the last thing I want us to consider is we were perishing. Turn in your Bibles to John chapter 3. John chapter 3. John 3, verse 16. I know if I said John 3, 16, you wouldn't turn there. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. We were perishing. But because of what Jesus did, we have the opportunity to have eternal life. God treasures us. Franklin Graham once said, In Islam, you have to die for Allah. The God I worship died for me. I don't really think it matters which way you look at the parables of the hidden fee or the hidden treasure and the pearl of great price. There are some things that become abundantly clear. Abundantly clear. The kingdom of heaven 
is the greatest treasure that has ever been discovered. Anybody that wants to can have the $200 million that they find in the superstition mountains of Arizona. That's, that's their business. The kingdom of heaven is the one, the treasure that we should strive after. We also need to realize that the kingdom of heaven comes at a high price. You know, what was Jesus willing to do to offer you eternal life? He was willing to give his life so that you, so that I can have the opportunity to come to him. The least we could do is give our lives in submission, in obedience to him, understanding that it will cost us something to follow God. It will cost us our time and our energy. And if the, if the kingdom of God is not costing you anything right now, you're not acting as a Christian. If it doesn't cost your finances, if it doesn't cost your energy, you probably aren't living in the way God wants you to. If we want to be like the early church, we are going to give in the way that they give. They gave of their money and they gave of their time. It cost them something. And in the parables, the kingdom of heaven is like someone who finds something precious and sells all that they have to give it. That's my challenge to you tonight. But I'll say this. It didn't, doesn't really add up to much compared to what God has given me and what God has given you. God loved you and me so much that he was willing to die for someone who was dead, someone who was held captive, someone who had no identity whatsoever, and someone who was perishing. It can't get much worse than someone who's dead and perishing. But God was willing to send his son for us. What are you going to do tonight? When I think of passages like this, I can't help but look in the mirror and think, well, I haven't sold all that I have and given it to the poor. I have these sins in my life. And I haven't done anything lately to get them out. And I lay that alongside what God has done for me. And I realize I come up short. And I'm sure you probably think that too. While we still have breath, we still have opportunity for obedience. Tonight, we're going to offer an invitation. I want you to consider how great that day will be when the Lord says to those who followed him, well done, my good and faithful servant. Make your choices today with that day in mind. But I'm not going to lie to you. It's going to cost you something. It cost God something. But praise be to God that we have an opportunity to seek after the kingdom of heaven. Praise be to God that he loved us so much that he was willing to give everything for us. How are you going to respond to him? The Bible is clear that we must hear the word of God. We must hear about what Jesus did for us, and we must hear about how Jesus is the Son of God. We must believe that he is the Son of God, believe that he died on a cross for our sins, believe that he is Lord. And you need to be willing to confess that confess that Jesus is Lord, confess that he is the Christ, the Son of the living God. You need to repent of your sins. In our parable, 
in our parables, repentance took the form of selling everything to buy that one pearl or that one hidden treasure. Repentance is a changing of mind and a changing of action. It is getting rid of, turning our back on the things of this world, the sins that we're involved in, and it is about turning toward God and chasing after Him. The Bible is also clear that you must be immersed in water for the forgiveness of your sins. You must be baptized for the remission of your sins in the name of the Father and the Son of the Holy Spirit. And it's at that point that you come in contact with the blood of Jesus and all those blessings we talked about will go to you. You will be put into Christ. If you are in Christ tonight, if you are a Christian, consider what being a Christian has cost you. Consider what being a Christian means about how it is giving up of our own life and taking on the life that Jesus has laid out for us. Taking up our cross daily and following him. Is it costing you anything? The Bible is clear that it should. It should cost us. We should give our lives to him. If you have any need of the invitation tonight, please come. Why together we stand and sing.